Associate Manager at Gowan Hurst Clark and Smith in the Business Advisory and Tax Service Department. He graduated from the University of Kansas. I will hold that against you. <laughs> with a Bachelor of Science in Accounting and also a Master's of Accounting in May of 2011. Jonathan's area of expertise includes small business accounting, taxation, along with consulting clients on their process and procedures. So please welcome Jonathan. Uh, thank you for the welcome. Um, I'd also, also like to thank the Very Good Morning part uh, partnership, partnership for allowing me to be here to speak today. Um, I am a CPA, and we're going to be talking about the five ideas you wish your calendar told you. Um, and uh, hopefully we get this par uh, presentation together. Um, so a little bit about myself. I did graduate from the University of Kansas, Rock Chalk. Um, <laughs> Is there? That's nice. Uh, no one's leaving here, so that's nice. Um, I've been in the profession for 10 years. Um, previously, was working in Kansas and then had the opportunity to come up to West Des Moines and join uh, McGowan Hurst, Clark & Smith. I'm a manager there, and my focus is on small business, accounting, and taxation, and also consult clients on their processes and, processes and procedures within their firms. So the agenda today is to... Um, Talk about thinking of the future now for your bit small business, how to protect your assets. Don't mess with the government. We'll be talking about some taxes. How to grow your business. And finally, don't leave money on the table. You know, some deductions or credits that you could be taking. Um, and also at the end of the presentation, I should I'll leave some time for any questions that you might have. So we'll get started here. So uh, thinking for the future now. Um, is really, you know, investing in your company, um, not being short-sighted sighted when wanting to spend money on your company. Um, we're going to cover three different areas, technology, the organization of your business, and then your energy choice. So with technology, um, the assets and technology that you, you spend money on now will pay off later. Um, with technology these days, you should not be completing any transactions by hand. Um, there's so many different programs and softwares out there that will make your life so much easier if you just spend a little bit of money and utilizing those. Some of the benefits of using that accounting software, um, the ease of completing transactions. Um, some of the software will um, even connect you to your bank and credit card information and pull that information automatically into the software. So it eliminates a lot of the data entering and other stuff that a lot of small businesses will have to go through. And it allows you to spend more time actually in your business, which is good. Um, if you're using accounting software, your stuff's going to be a lot more organized, your financials. Um, you'll be able to use it in your business, be able to see how, how you're doing week to week or month to month. And then it'll be less time spent by a professional trying to get that stuff organized. Um, we'll appreciate a lot more coming from my perspective. And then hopefully we'll spend a lot less um, time and money on professional fees. And then um, if you have the accounting software, you can also do some year-to-year -year analysis on your financials. So you can see how the trends of your company is going. So if your revenues are going up 5% every year, that's good. If your employee cost is getting really high, you know what's, what's causing that? Kind of look and have a little bit more detailed uh, analysis on your financials with that software. And if you are in need of software, um, make sure to consult a professional um, to see you know what would be the best fit for you. There's a lot of different options out there. Um, so you know use a professional to help you know find the software that works and then help get you set up and transition to make to make you use that ha have you use that software a little bit easier um, with training. Um, just really to get the most out of your investment. Um, you're going to be spending some money to get the software, so you definitely want to be using it to its full potential for what you need. Uh, the second part we'll be talking about is the organization of your business. And mainly we'll be talking about a business plan. And the business plan will help guide you through each stage of starting and managing your business. Um, you use a business plan as, as a roadmap to help how to structure, run, and grow your business. Um, it's a way to think through your elements of your business so you have an understanding of, of what, what needs to happen. Um, and with a business plan, usually you're kind of you know, um, showing this to investors or um, outside um, you know, 
bankers or something like that, or bankers. And so this will be a good way for them to, for you to be able to sell your business to those people to have, so they'll have a good understanding of what you're trying to do and have some confidence in you. Um, and once you get the business plan set up, it's good to seek some professional advice on how, how it looks. Um, consult a legal person to see if a legal tax lawyer, if um, to see how all your legal documents look. And then also seek um, a CPA just to um, solidify some of your financial numbers. The worst thing you can do is take a business plan and to an investor and have them criticize it. So you just wanna make sure it's as solid as possible. Uh, with the business plan, um, there's nine different sections that you can include. Um, it just really depends on your business of so which ones are important or which ones aren't. Um, so like the executive summary, it will briefly tell what your company is and why it's gonna be successful. It'll include like your mission statement, um, the product and service you'll have and basic information about your leadership of your organization. The, market, the company description will have a little more detail about your company, um, maybe their story of how it came about or how long you've been in business. Um, the market analysis will kind of kind of explain um, what the tradition, what the market is and out in your area, um, how you think the industry is going to be looking, you know, down the road. The organization and management will be more of your legal documents, so setting up a operating agreement and making sure you have the right entity choice um, to fit what you what you need for your structure. The service and product line will basically just describe what what you are offering to clients and what makes that makes that special compared to the next guy down the road. Uh, marketing sales, um, this is very important to give the investors uh, confidence in what you are doing and what you are selling, that you can go out and actually um, make, it, make, make it successful. And this will also change um, from the very beginning of your business to five years down the road to 10 years down the road. So this will evolve and, and change um, with your company. Uh, the funding request will be the document that you'll state you know, how much money you think you'll need to get, get this thing rolling, um, get your company going. And it'll also have you know, either you're looking for investors or bankers and kind of what your payment plan um, will be to get, that, get those people paid back or get some return on their investment. Uh, financial projections will be, be more looking at your income, um, income and expenses and projecting that out five years down the road or 10 years down the road um, to give your investors um, some uh, some sort of uh, idea that you, that your business is stable and that you will be successful, and that's where really like a CPA can come in and help you out on that. And then appendix might have um, any other documents that you think might be needed. So the next part is entity choice. Um, choosing your own entity choice can cause a lot of tax and legal issues for a company. Um, and have, choosing your, your uh, entity choice will depend on the in industry and the structure of your business. As you see on the list, there's quite a few different s choices and each one's different. Each one has its own pros and cons. Um, it's just really, you just really need to seek professional advice to which one will, will help you get the most benefit out of your company. Um, even if you are set up currently, it doesn't hurt to talk to a professional to make sure it is correct. Um, usually, you do have some possibility of getting it switched around if your entity doesn't fit you very well or fit what, what you're trying to do in the future. Um, so make sure you just get that correct. And also with the entity choice, um, once you select one, make sure you run your business accordingly. Um, so if you're an S corporation, you're paying yourself, uh, if you have some distributions coming out, make sure you pay yourself an owner's wage. Um, if you're a partnership or LLC, you can't pay yourself an owner's wage. So there's little, there's little um, differences between the, every single one of those. So just make sure you understand what you need to be doing. Okay, the second idea I wanna share with is how to protect your assets. And as a business owner, you know, protecting your, um, your business from fraud is always on the front of your mind. So the most important thing is you build all this income and revenue and success in your company is the last thing you want is someone just to be stealing it from you, basically. Um, as a small business, it might be easy to forget how much financial, financial control one individual might have. They might be the most tr trustworthy employee you have, but it takes one little life event and they'll change completely. So um, 
In this area, we'll discuss the separation of financial responsibility, the fraud triangle, and owner's responsibility. So se the separation of financial duties is basically having a segregation, segregation of duties between the financial area of your business. So you really don't want to rely on one person to run everything on your financial side for you because it gives them the opportunity to be able to take advantage of you. Now, I understand with small businesses, you might not have the option to, you maybe just have to only have the ability to trust one person because of, um, of where you're at in your business. But it's important to try to understand of what you're trying to accomplish with segregation in, of duties and to make sure that, that um, uh, you try not to have them execute too many of your financial portions that they can be able to take advantage of you. Um, so now I'm going to share some 2016 st statistics of embezzlement. So 80% of embezzlements happen in a business with less than 100 employees. So, I mean, usually we're more geared towards smaller businesses that will be more affected by this. 40% of the thefts are committed by someone in the finance and accounting department. Usually they have the, the ability to commit those crimes more easily. They'll have access to your financial records or bank, bank accounts. 33% of the thefts, employee thefts, involve businesses in the financial services and nonprofit sectors. So financial services usually have a lot of cash coming in and out of their company, so it's pretty easy to, for the fraudster to hide their, uh, fraud, their, their crimes. And then nonprofits, are usually more geared towards their, their mission statements and wanting to push that out to the industry or to the, the community. And so they really don't focus a lot on their accounting um, portion. So usually they get taken advantage of, which is just pretty sad, actually. 36% um, involved, projected, involved projected losses of excess of $500,000. So, I mean, can you imagine losing $500,000 of your company and not even knowing about it? It happens. Um, 49 is the median age of, of the accused. Um, I, I thought this was kind of surprising, but the, the more I thought about it, usually, you know, as you, as you get a little bit older in your age, you'll have more life events that might be causing this pressure that you will need to commit this illegal act to be able to solve a, solve a problem for you. Uh, women commit 56.3% of the embezzlements. Um, it's, I don't think it's anything because the sexes or anything like that, but I think, I think this is more related to I think they are in that position more than what men are at this point. 20% um, of the losses involved $1 million or more. So we're really getting up high amounts there. An average loss is $807,000. So as you can see, embezzlement is a big area you should be focusing on. Um, and it'll, it'll have a huge effect on your company if it ever happens to you. So as a business owner, um, you know, what, what's going to cause your employee to commit fraud? And this fraud triangle kind of goes through the steps that an individual will be motivated enough to, um, to commit the, the, the fraud. So the first step is pressure, second is opportunity, and the third is rationalization. So the first step, pressure, arises when the employee has some sort of problem that they cannot solve within their own legitimate means. And the employee also believes their problem is unshareable. So usually, you know, it could be related to health or gambling or any other debts related to some sort of addiction. Um, they're too embarrassed or don't want to share this with anybody else, so they, they won't seek help. And so they're going to try to find a way to com figure this out themselves, and usually, you know, it'll push them enough to do the, the illegal act. The second stage is opportunity, and so that's giving the person committing the fraud the ability to complete the crime. Um, the employee sees a clear course of action by which they can abuse their financial power and control to manipulate the system in order to make it work. Um, and their solution will always have a low risk of getting caught, so they don't believe they're going to get caught. Um, if they would, they wouldn't be doing this. And the last stage is rationalization. Um, most offenders of white collar crime are first time offenders, so they need to have some sort of mental, um, moral compass type shift for them to be able to commit this crime. Um, 
And usually the reasoning will be something, I'm just going to borrow this money. I'll pay it back. Um, I've earned this money. I'm just providing for my family. I'm underpaid or not appreciated. And um, the owner is dishonest. As the owner is a dishonest person, so I'm just taking advantage of them. Um, none of that's real fair, but that's what they'll go through to be able to come to the conclusion that they can't commit this crime. So as a business owner, what are you supposed to do? How do you, how do you protect yourself? And really the first thing to do is, you know, take away some of the stages of the fraud triangle. And one thing is just to, to be an active owner. So look at the bank statement, check the accounting system once in a while, look at clear checks. And above all, make, make, at least make your employees think you're doing that because then it'll, they'll change their idea of their risk level up. So um, get the bank statement. You don't have to open it. You just have it in your office somewhere or whatever. Just make them think that you're doing it. And it's going to scare them away from even trying it. Uh, also, kind of understand what your employees are going through personally. Um, if you know that they had some health issues or um, if you can hear them talking to creditors on the phone or something like that. Just pay attention to them and see if anything raises a red flag. Um, if they have a change of attitude at work or if they pull up driving a nicer car than you, then that's also something you might pay attention to. And the last thing you can do is if you're still uncomfortable with the amount of power that you have your one employee have, try outsourcing it to somebody else. So outside bookkeeping service or accounting firm, um, that's really going to take away the whole problem and that employee won't even try to do anything because they, they'll, they'll know that they're going to get caught. Excuse me, I'm not, you don't do this for a living, so I'm not used to talking so much. Uh, how to, uh, real life story. So this just happened in our firm a couple, couple months ago. Um, a business owner had an employee, he's been in there for 15 plus years. And in the past six years, she stole over $200,000 from him. Um, the only reason it was caught was the, the owner was in the technology industry and he was looking to sell his company to another company, to someone else. And she knew that um, they were going to be looking at the financials a lot closer and then her opportunities to keep doing the embezzlement would go away once, once they got purchased. Um, so she just came in and confessed the crime actually to him. So he wouldn't have even known. But the business owner was just real frustrated because he trusted her with everything. And to have her just steal $200,000 right underneath him w without him even knowing, it, it, it's just, I can't, I can't believe it. And so, you know, this stuff happens next door, happens to the next business down the road. It happens here. You can't just assume it just happens somewhere else or bigger companies or whatever. So you just need to protect yourself, um, take away the, the stages of the fraud triangle just so you don't even put yourself in this position. So the third idea we'll be discussing is not messing with the government. And this will be dealing with taxes. So Texans are proud people and they have sayings. Don't mess with taxes is one of them. CPAs are proud people too and we have sayings and it says don't mess with taxes. So um, as a business owner, the last thing you want to do is, is not, not pay your taxes. Having back taxes really is going to cripple your business. And we see more and more business fail because they, do, they have back tax issues. Um, as a business owner, you know you have monthly, quarterly, yearly taxes, and you know, everything's out there for liabilities. Um, make sure you understand what you're responsible for. And if you don't understand, seek a professional to kind of understand what you need to be doing to stay, stay on track. Um, once, you do not, once you decide not to pay a tax and you start having some back taxes to collect, um, that, that, that tax is just going to keep growing and growing and growing. So you have back taxes and your current taxes, and it's just going to be a hard road um, for anyone to come back from. And along with owing, owing taxes, if you don't pay them, the government's going to assess penalties and interest. And one of the most interesting penalties is the trust fund penalty, and that's a penalty of not paying your payroll taxes. And what this allows the government to, to do is come and attack you personally, and it'll, it'll um, bypass your corporate uh, structure and go straight to you personally and they'll take your money from your home, savings accounts, retirement, um, 
college savings, whatever they need to be able to get those funds. Um, the reason they'll do this, especially with payroll taxes, um, part of your payroll tax that you remit to the government is actually paid by your employee. So technically at that point, you're almost like stealing from your own employees and they don't look, they don't, they don't like that on the, on the government end. So they're gonna come after you and try and get the money any way possible. Yeah, super aggressive. Uh, the next part is sales tax. So um, states are getting more and more aggressive with collecting sales tax. Um, usually it's because a lot of states are operating at deficits at this point. So um, if you are selling products and, or services, make sure you know the sales tax laws. Um, a nice rule of thumb is tangible property is taxed unless exempted by law. So unless you can go out to the code and figure out why it's not taxable, you should assume it is taxable. And services are excluded unless specified taxable by law. So a little bit opposite there. Um, I know from when I have my time in Kansas to coming up here, um, when I used to get my hair cut in Kansas, I never paid sales tax. I come up here, now I'm paying sales tax on, on my haircut. So it's just a little bit, from state to state, everything changes. So you just can't assume, because um, they don't pay sales tax in this state, if you start off offering products in other states that you don't, you're not subject to sales tax there either. The other area that they're being very aggressive with is use tax. Um, use tax is assessed when you purchase a product from, out of, from a vendor out of state, and then you don't pay sales tax on it. Um, technically, you are required to remit that sales tax portion it, to Iowa, and a lot of times people aren't doing that. And so what happens if, 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 if you go through a uh, uh, sales tax uh, audit, they'll go, go ahead and also do a use tax audit at the same time, and they'll, make you they'll go through your invoices and see anything that you purchased that didn't have sales tax and make you prove why you didn't pay sales tax on that. And usually they'll come back and really get you for quite a bit of money at that, it, at that end. Um, one way with use tax that you can protect yourself a little bit um, is that even if you have, um, if you do not have any use tax associated with you, still file the zero um, sales tax returns just to start your statute of limitations, which limits the government to only go back the past three years. If you do not start that statute of limitations, they can open up any tax period that, that they want. So. Tax planning. Um, I know you know a lot of people have a stigma with CPAs that we're only related to making you pay taxes and do all this stuff, but really the, the flip end of it is we're here to help you minimize your tax situation. So the key is to utilize us before you have you know big changes in your company instead of after the fact, because we it just really limits us, really handcuffs us to be able to do much for you at that point. Um, some, you know, Ideas are, you know, when you have big changes, some of the, some of the ideas might be like new, when you buy new equipment and you're purchasing a company or selling a company. If you're going through anything like that, contact a professional just to make sure you're doing everything correctly. Um, there's different ways to, um, to structure it. So you, you have one bit bigger tax benefits one way or the other, or even, you know, the timing of it, doing it one year compared to another year because of tax laws. And, you know, our goal as a CPA is to be your trusted advisor. Um, we succeed because our businesses succeed. So it, it's our goal to help you um, minimize your taxable situation. Just give us the opportunity to do that. Number four, how to grow your business. So in this section, we'll cover what to pay, to, pay attention to on your financials, um, how to use debt correctly, and how to forecast out your business. So growing your business can be a very delicate process, especially if you're going very aggressive with it. Um, we've seen a lot of clients will have huge revenue numbers, huge profit numbers, and no cash in their company. And as a business owners, you know cash is king. So um, no matter what, you wanna make sure you keep that cash in your business. Um, so, you know, a very easy thing to do is pay attention to your financials to see how everything's kind of working together. And then um, we'll uh, talk through a few of those ideas here in, a, here in, a, in the next slide. So accounts receivable is one area where you can have a little bit of power to control how much cash is coming to your business. 
Um, so accounts receivables, if you sell a product to somebody and you invoice them out, um, usually everything's on your accounts receivable until they pay you that cash in. Um, so you're making that sale, which is counted as your revenue, but you're not seeing the financial, the cash impact of it, the cash inflow until you get paid. So, you know, the important thing is, you know, when you keep making sales is to keep collecting on the customers. Because um, what happens is you have more and more sales, usually your expenses, your operating expenses, payroll, inventory, those are also growing at the same rate. So if you're not very good about collecting your cash and you ha you're paying out all these expenses, you're not gonna have any, you aren't gonna have any money in your, in your company. So um, keep close attention to your collection days on AR and maintain a consistent number of days. If they start expanding, um, it can cause less cash inflow for your business. And some strategies to do to help you out is, you know, send out invoices promptly. So once you make a sale, don't wait 30 days to send out that invoice. Cut down that period by sending that invoice within a week or a couple days. Um, makes a huge difference. Also, you can offer discounts for quick pay. So on your invoice, you can offer a one to 2% discount to people for uh, paying within the first 10 days or, or whatever you decide to do. Um, you'd be surprised how many people will take advantage of that discount. And it also, you know, how much, how important that is for you to be able to get that cash 15 days earlier. That, you know, the, usually the benefit of getting that cash quicker is more than just losing out on that one, one to 2%. Um, you can charge late fees to encourage them from not, not paying you. And follow up with customers to slow pay. Um, I know as a business owner, that is the worst thing to do is try to collect collections. Um, but you really need to be a bulldog with them um, and really um, not be afraid to go out after them and call them and bug them to be paying you because it's just as important as you for you to get paid than for them to not be paying you. On the other side, um, accounts payable. <coughs> so you have a little bit different strategy on accounts payable. And accounts payable is usually related to paying your vendors inventory and operating expenses. Um, a lot of times um, you'll, you'll see companies will get a bill and they'll quickly turn around and pay that bill in one or two days. Um, there's no reason to do that. Take advantage of those 30 day pay periods because I've never seen an award or any sort of prize for being the fastest payer in the world. So. Um, take advantage of those payment terms and keep that cash in your bank in case some sort of emergency does come up. Um, also, be very lean with your inventory. Inventory is where you can suck up, you know, put a lot of your cash, cash into. You might not get that money back out for a long time. Um, and then if they do offer a discount, like we discussed on the AR side, um, consider paying within that window to get, get that discount. You know, you, you do want to weigh your odds or weigh your situation and see, hey, do I have any other big expenses coming out that I sh it might be better for me just to keep this instead of taking advantage of that discount. But, you know, take advantage of it if you can. And with both accounts receivable and accounts payable, this is really where that technology, having that accounting software really makes a huge benefit uh, for you to be able to pay closer attention to these, these ideas. You have some sort of aging in there. You can see when stuff's supposed to be paid. You can see which customers aren't paying you very quickly. Um, if you're doing your transactions by hand or in Excel, you don't have that ability. So it's really hard for you to be able to tell. Uh, debt. Um, you know, you can really grow your business by using debt. Um, I don't think debt's bad. Um, there's just a proper way to using debt. Um, no company should, so, so for an example, um, you can kind of compare your business to like your household. Um, if you had $60,000 of cash in your, in your checking account and you needed to go buy a $50,000 car, um, would you just go and spend your $50,000 of cash on that car or would you take out the, your loan and pay, have that payments out over five years at a smaller interest rate? So, I mean, and, and, you, and the whole reason you want to do that is you want to keep that cash in for other emergency situations. So that's what you want to be using debt for. So I don't believe any company should be completely debt free and then they also shouldn't be over leveraged. So if you have more debt than assets, um, you're circ circling your drain, so you really need to change something in your business to be able to um, make that change. Um, using debt and cash will also will add a nice mix of alternatives for businesses to help with cash flow. Um, and establish your banking re relationship early. Um, bankers um, 
find a banker that wants to be in your business, wants to help you grow, wants, wants to be your, your partner. Um, it's really going to help you when you need to go for a loan or anything else. And then also, don't be afraid to get uh, access to a line of credit. You don't need that line. If you, even if you don't need that line of credit at this point, it's just nice having that in, in your back pocket in case you ever do. Um, we'll see you know, a lot of companies, you know, if, they, if they have a customer that they're expecting payment from and the customer missed their payment and now they have to make a payroll and they can't afford the $5,000 for payroll, you know, instead of dipping into credit cards or anything like that, use this line of credit because it's usually those interest rates are a lot cheaper and it's a lot easier to use. Forecasting, um, this will be like projecting out your income and expenses um, for your business to see kind of what your effect will be on, on cash. And you definitely want to do this if you're planning on doing like a super aggressive growth. Um, because as you, as you grow, you'll notice the more sales and mo more um, revenue you'll have, the more expenses and operating costs you could have. And there, should, there might be a per certain point in your, in your business life cycle that you're not going to have any cash. And at that point, you got to decide, you know, do I change X, Y, Z to make sure I'll be okay when I hit that certain point? Or do I need to be looking for outside investors or be using debt a certain way to be able to make sure I keep cash in my business? And this is also where you should really use your technology. Um, there's a ton of tools readily available to use um, to figure this help, help forecast out your cash. And if you're still uncomfortable with it, seek a professional to kind of kind of see what needs to happen. Um, I always say I'd rather know seven months out where I'm going to be at instead of just being the current month and knowing I have no cash. So it's, it's a little easier for you to plan. Um, the more knowledge and expectations you have, um, the, the better it is for your company. Don't leave money on the table. Fifth and final idea. So Uncle Sam loves you paying taxes and everything, but they do offer some de deductions and credits that could be useful to taxpayers. And we're going to discuss a few of those today. And the, real, the big key is to know how and when to use these deductions. So you have your one, Section 179 deduction, your business use of home, vehicles, hiring of your children, and the research and development credit. A Section 179 deduction is basically a salary depreciation method that allows you to deduct the full price, purchase price of an asset in that current year of purchase instead of having to depreciate that out over five years. And what this allows you to do is kind of match, ma match your cash outflow with your taxes so you don't have a big um, difference in that, in that area. So it, it does give you immediate tax benefit for purchasing the capital assets. And in 2017, um, your deduction limit is $500,000 for federal taxes. Iowa is limited to only $25,000, which is kind of rough on taxpayers and for tax planning purposes. Um, so you will have a difference between those two. You can still take up the $500,000 federal. You just kind of have a difference on your Iowa return. Um, and the 179 deduction is limit, limit, limited, limited if you have gross income. So you can only deduct it if you, if you are a profitable business. You cannot take the deduction to, to create a loss. Um, if you, so for example, if you have $50,000 in net profit in your company and your 179 deduction, you, you can take up to $100,000. $100, the IRS will not let you take it down to negative $50,000. Um, they're going to make it go back up to zero, but then they will allow you to carry that extra $50,000 forward to the next, next years. So you can still take that deduction, you just might not be able to use it in the current year. There are certain rules for like build outs, um, for like remodels of business locations and stuff like that. And those are a little bit more better benefit because usually those asset lives are 15 years. So instead of depreciating out over 15 years, you can take it all in the current year. Um, business use of home. Um, this is a deduction for owners to complete their business in their home. Um, and it should be exclusively for 
it's only for available to people who exclusively will use their home for their business location. So more towards people um, using their garage to do a, to do their small business or a traveling salesperson that has a home office and that's their main location. Um, this allows you to deduct a portion of your home expenses, the real estate taxes, mortgage interest, rent, utilities, insurance, depreciation, maintenance, repairs, any of that. Um, the deduction percentage is based on your business area in your house compared to your total house square footage. So uh, if you have a 100 square foot office in your house and your total square footage is 1,000 square feet, then you can, you can deduct 10% of these um, expenses on, on your business return. Um, the IRS a couple years ago released a simplified method where they'll let you deduct $5 per square foot of your business portion. So from our previous example, if you have a 100 square foot office, you can get up to a $500 deduction without having to do any of the, the, the work of calculating your real estate tax, taxes or any of your home expenses. Yeah. So if we have, we have an employee who works remotely from Tennessee, she couldn't take advantage of this even though it's, that's actually in her office. So the question was, can an employee take, take advantage of this uh, business use at home? And they can take advantage of it, but it's on their Schedule A, on their personal return. It wouldn't be directly related to the business gotcha. return. So I'm more going from the business perspective. That's perfect, okay, thank you. Um, and you must have gross income in order to take this deduction. So similar to the Section 179 deduction, you can't use this deduction to create a loss in your company. And they do all allow you to uh, carry it forward. So even if you are not profitable, profitable but, and, but you are you do using your business outside, inside your home, still claim your deduction so you can carry that forward so you can be utilized um, once you do make a profit. Vehicle expense. Um, so you have two different methods to calculate your vehicle expense. You have your standard mileage, which is for 2017, 53.5 cents per business mile. And you cannot depreciate your vehicle if you are doing the standard mileage method because depreciation is already accounted for in that 53.5 cents. Or you have the actual cost method, which is similar to business use of home. So you calculate your actual cost of owning the vehicle, gas repairs, taxes, insurance, and then take your total business miles over your total miles, your total miles driven, and then whatever percentage that is, you can deduct um, against those, those car expenses. With actual cost method, you can depreciate your vehicle. And then if your vehicle is over 6,000 gross, gross vehicle weight, um, so like a SUV or truck, you can utilize up to $25,000 of the purchase price uh, for the Section 179 deduction. So that's pretty powerful when it comes to business planning for, for owners. And once you establish a method for, for a vehicle, that method has to stay with that vehicle until that, that vehicle is no longer in service. So you can't switch between the methods. The question was, how, how, how would you determine the best way to go about which one to take? Um, usually, from my perspective, we'll kind of calculate both ways and see which way it comes out better for you. Does it matter what entity your business is qualified? If it's an S-Corp versus a partnership, do one of these work better? Uh, the question was, does an entity uh, choice affect which one, which way to go. Um, you know, each, each one's gonna be a little bit different, so um, I'll, I'll get back to you on that one. So there are some IRS issues um, when it comes to documentation. So vehicle mileage, you do need to keep a logbook to track your total miles, miles and business miles. And for the business miles, you need to include where you went and what the business purpose was. And along the same lines, for meals and entertainment expenses, um, you need to keep your receipts. And on their receipt, include who the meeting was with and what the purpose of the meeting is. If you ever get audited and you do not have this documented, the IRS will just assume um, these expenses are all personal and won't allow you to, to deduct them. So um, we've, seen uh, we've seen little situations of 
you know, a, a, a client had $10,000 of auto expense, didn't keep a log book, and they threw it all out. And he was at a 25% um, tax bracket, and so that cost him an additional $2,500 in taxes just because he didn't document it. So um, $2,500 to do your documentation right, I mean, you know, just, just make sure you follow what they're wanting and needing just so you don't have to ever run into this situation. Yep. Um, what's your thought on, if I needed an app to track mileage, and then it's an IRS approved app? Yeah, that, the, the is question that, is, um, what exactly. do you think of the apps when it comes to keeping track of mileage? I think that's awesome. So very easy to use and pull, and um, you track, you start at one area, once you get to your next area, you stop it. Um, I'd highly, highly suggest that instead of using a, a log book Hiring of your, of your children is a kind of an interesting tax planning thing you can do. So this allows you to shift your income from your parents, from the, like the parents' tax rate to your children's tax rate. Um, so, you know, if, if the children's gross income is under the standard deduction, and so for federal that's $6,350, and for Iowa it's about $5,000. So if, if you pay your child under $5,000 and they have no other gross income, you know, technically they, they will not have any tax due for them. So you technically will not have to file a tax return. And so it's a nice way to shift um, t um, that $5,000 in income from one a higher tax rate to a zero tax rate. Well, I mean, the standard deduction thing is only is going to be as long as you, can, you claim them as a dependent. So. Most likely, if you're fully, um, you know, supporting them through college. Um, if they're under the age 18 and you are an LLC, um, you are not subject to FICA taxes on their on their payroll either. So that's pretty that's pretty cool little feature there. Um, and if you are an LLC, if you are a partnership, or um, if you are a partnership, you have to make sure your the husband and wife are both included in that before you can be able to do this. If you are an S corp, you do have to pay FICA taxes still. Um, and the main thing is you have to make sure your child is working in your company to qualify for this. Um, yeah, so have some sort of documentation that they're sweeping or filing or doing something. Um, you cannot pay your two-year-old child to do whatever, sleep or whatever they do at two, um, and expect the IRS to be okay with it. The last part is research and development credit. And this is kind of a really popular area of opportunity for people. So this credit is given to businesses who incur R&D costs within the United States. And it's any cost um, trying to produce a new or improved product, process, or software. And with it being a credit, it helps reduce your taxes dollar for dollar. And then on the Iowa side, it is a refundable credit. So if you had $15,000 due in Iowa and your credit in Iowa is $30,000, they'd literally give you a $15,000 check. So that's pretty powerful. So Iowa's not very nice in the 179 deduction, but they are nice here. Um, so on the federal side, if you cannot use the full credit in the first year, you can't carry it forward for up to 20 years. So eventually you'll be able to use it. Um, if you've never claimed a credit, so if you go home and you're like, oh, I want to do this R&D credit today, you do have the ability to go back to three years and amend your tax returns and recoup that cost. So you can claim this credit up to, up to the past three years. And then for new companies, this is kind of a, a new, new little um, feature that they added. You can take the credit against payroll taxes. So as a newer company, you might not have a lot of tax liability when you first start up but they still allow you to take that credit against payroll taxes so you can get some benefit from this credit. Now with the research and development credit, um, there's over 40 different industries that are, that are eligible for the credit. And I have 10 listed up here on the slide. And I mean, there's a lot in here that you wouldn't expect to qualify for this. So what, 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 what it is, is a very powerful, powerful, powerful credit that goes unused a lot of the time. So if you feel like you might fit in this bucket, um, seek a professional to see if, if it will work for you because it's, it's very powerful and it can really add a lot of benefit to your company.
So to wrap it up, the five ideas were thinking of the future now, how to protect your assets, don't mess with the government, how to grow your business, and don't leave money on the table. Any questions? Yep. Um, all the debt that you had three years on, it, do you have to have spent it in that prior three year period or could you have spent it in the current year and take the credit in the prior three years? So the question is if you, if you with the R&D credit, when you go back for three years, do you have to spend that, that, those expenses in those years that you're amending? Um, yes, you do. Okay, um, I do want to put a little disclaimer out there, I'm a C CPA, so uh, not all these ideas may be applicable to you and your business, so please seek a professional to make sure they will fit with your, your, your business. And then, you, I guess on my business cards, but here's my information for anyone else in, in, on the internet land or wherever you're at, um, if you want to contact me to discuss this any further. Great, well thanks Jonathan. <laughs> Yep. Okay, so he'll hang out if you have kind of a more personal question. I mean, you want to hang around. I just want to note a couple things in front of you. There were some pieces of paper. There's a survey, so if you can give us um, some feedback on that survey, even other additional topics that are of interest to you. So we, we do this series once a month. Um, it helps us keep going on what we need to do better. Um, and then additional topics that we could uh, recruit speakers to come in and teach for you. A couple upcoming events all uh, pertaining to small businesses. We do have our first Fridays. Um, it will be at the Iowa Center out in Clive. We have Rachel um, Eubank, with, who is the president of Styx, coming in to talk about her journey and how Styx unfolded to be just kind of an art hobby into a nationwide business. So join us on that. The next Top 5 series is actually all on hiring. So if you're looking to expand, expand it's the top five things you need to know when hiring. There's a lot of things um, that we do wrong that can get us in trouble very quickly. That's on Wednesday, October 25th. And then if you are a retailer, we just signed up to be um, a live stream host with Google. Um, and the title is Reach Your Customers This Holiday Season. It will be on November 1st, and we will live stream here with Google. So feel free to join us for that. And then the big thing I wanted to put out there is the Small Business Success Summit is coming up on November uh, 10th. It is three keynotes, 18 breakout sessions, and 30 resource partners that will be there. It's $79 for the day to attend with us. Um, a lot of bang for your buck on that, but it will be a lot of topics like what you heard today. So if you're facing accounting, IT, HR, um, the keynotes will be Google. Uh, one is revolved around staying in your niche, and the third keynote is on uh, leadership because a lot of us fell into this position, right? We didn't go to school to be leaders, but yet we're trying to develop other leaders. So she'll come in and speak on that, and then the, all the other breakout sessions will involve on topics that you need to know about. So please consider joining us. There's only 400 seats available for that, and it is out to 6,000 members here. So if you're interested, jump on and register soon. So thanks for coming today, and uh, we will hopefully see you guys next month. Thank you.